So hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Ongoi Mwangi and I'm a Kenyan Naren. So I do videos on nursing education, patient teaching as well as health education. And this qualifies as a patient teaching as well as health education YouTube video. Uh, if it's your first time here, please take your time to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload. If you're a returning subscriber, know that I deeply, deeply appreciate you. So let's start and learn. So usually, for a client who is not able to feed via the normal oral route, uh, that is ingesting food with your mouth and eating it, swallowing it and digesting it, uh, there usually are a number of ways that food could reach your stomach, even without passing through your mouth. So percutaneous endoscopic gastrotomy tube or PEC feeding tube is one of these ways. And most of the time it is used for patients who are not able to swallow because of an obstruction between the stomach and the mouth. Uh, probably if you have any tumor, any swelling, any strictures between in your alimentary canal up to where the level of the stomach is, uh, between the stomach and the mouth, if there is nothing that uh, can communicate and your food cannot pass through, or you have just had some surgery that has affected that area, then most of the time they will do a percutaneous endoscopic gastrotomy tube to ensure that your nutrition is maintained and this is used for feeding and it is a, a very simple procedure that you can do your, for yourself at home but then or even a caregiver can do for you at home and therefore you will be shown how to take care of a peg tube and this is what we are going to be discussing so i'll dwell more on the indications and management so PEG stands for percutaneous endoscopic gastrotomy and it's a procedure in which a flexible tube is placed through the abdominal wall into the stomach. PEG allows nutrition, fluids, and or medications to be put directly into the stomach by passing the mouth and the esophagus. So it was first described in 1980 for use in children as an alternative food for feeding. PEG feeding tubes are now increasingly used for enteral nutrition for both children and adults, and it may be used uh, with a jejunal extension so it can be put from uh, the area called the jejunum which is part of the small intestine or the ileum that is the first portion or it can actually go directly into the stomach that is the time it will be called a gastrotomy tube so peg feeding is used where a patient cannot maintain adequate nutrition with oral intake especially if there are problems swallowing or that food traveling directly from the mouth to the stomach However, the simplicity of peg tube feeding has led to some to some people being concerned about its use when there is little or no clinical benefits. So when discussing the types of peg tube, we have a J tube and a G tube. A G tube is placed in the stomach and G stands for gastrotomy and that is when it will be called PEG or peg. That means it is at the stomach at the level of the stomach directly from the skin. And then a J-tube is placed in the small intestine and the J stands for the jejunum, a section of the small intestine, and the tube may also be placed. Uh, and this tube will be called a PEG, a PEG which is a percutaneous endoscopic uh, jejunostomy tube. So it can be used in situations and uh, it may be placed in the stomach and passed through to the jejunum depending on what the condition of the client and what is the intention of putting this tube in the first place. So there are those two main types, the jejunostomy tube and the gastrotomy tube. So what are the indication of having a PEG tube inserted? This include difficulties with oral intake, especially where obstruction is the, in the upper airway or upper gastrointestinal tract, and which makes this it is impossible to pass an esophagus tube because an esophagus tube will be passed through your nose all the way down to your tummy or to your stomach for you to be able to get your feed through the nose or through that nasogastric tube. So uh, most of the time uh, it can be put when there is neurologically unsafe swallowing and this could happen if a patient has acute ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, therefore, they are not able to swallow like normal people or they, they don't have the normal gag reflex. So even if it came back, they wouldn't know and that runs a risk of having aspiration. Then if there's chronic progressive neuromuscular disease, again, this is another indication for peg tube insertion. Another um, category of uh, indication is when there's failure of feeding, 
examples where someone has dementia or Alzheimer's, they are not able to remember that it is time to feed or they are not able to remember that they need to eat. Even if you're there and you're trying to assist them, they may not even be cooperating with eating and swallowing. And therefore, a tube can be put, just place food in their stomach. Another indication is cystic fibrosis because in this condition, there is a lot of secretions, there is a lot of blockages, and this would end up with uh, esophageal strictures, which is a narrowing of the alimentary canal, especially from the upper portion up to the stomach level, and this will impede feeding, and therefore a gastrotomy tube may be put. Then, if a patient is undergoing peritoneal dialysis, peg insertion can improve nutrition status but increases the, the risk of fungal peritonitis and failure of dialysis. Therefore, PEG insertion can be undertaken in patients on peritoneal di dialysis and should be stopped. And for this patient, the dialysis should be stopped for at least three days and prophylactic antifungal therapy be given. Then oropharyngeal and esophageal malignancy. So if you have a tumor around that area, uh, the area between your mouth and the the alimentary canal up to your stomach, then it means that you're not able to swallow because the tumor is occluding the alimentary canal or the gut. And therefore, a peg tube will be inserted there to your stomach to ensure that you have a way of nutrition. So other indications for having a peg inserted may be a malignant bowel obstruction because, again, this goes without saying you're not able to maintain your nutrition. A head injury. Uh, because this in this situation you are not able to have your swallowing reflex or to have the gag reflex which makes it possible for you to not to get food in your airway. And then uh, Crohn's disease is one of the indications, especially when it is severe. If there is a uh, fistula anywhere along the alimentary canal up to the stomach level, then a peg tube may be called for. Other causes would include short bowel syndrome. Uh, some patients with AIDS and HIV and cephalopathy, again for the same reasons, because they re we run a risk of having uh, aspiration pneumonia, especially because of their inability to have the gag reflex, which is very important when you're swallowing, because if food goes to the wrong pipe, then most likely you're going to choke and cough. Uh, but if they don't have that reflex, again, they might the food might go to the wrong area, and this will cause a lot of more problems. And a patient, again, with severe burns may require a peg tube for feeding. Indication for peg in children include neurological disorders with an inability to swallow or painful swallowing that is dysphagia. Then if there is craniofacial abnormalities, oncology problems with malnutrition, especially if the oncology issue or the cancer is within the alimentary canal up to the stomach level, that goes without saying the patient will not be able to swallow properly and this will require some alternative method for delivering food to the stomach. And then we have other clinical conditions that lead to wasting and malnutrition such as chronic kidney disease, cystic fibrosis, metabolic problems, chronic infections such as HIV, cardiac disorders, short bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease. So there are quite a number of indications for PEG and let's see more. So the use of PEG tube have, been, have had controversial reports and concerns and therefore we have some contraindication of having PEG and this include there is absolute contraindication for use of PEGs in adult. For example, those with active coagulopathies and thrombocytopenia for patients with platelets of less than 50 times 10 to the power of 9 per liter. And this must be corrected before the tube insertion because there are no risk of bleeding out. Then anything that precludes endoscopy such as hemodynamic compromise, sepsis or perforated viscous, then that that will go without saying that we do not need to put a peg tube because it will lead to more complications. Then we have relative contraindications for use of, of PEG in adults include acute severe illness, anorexia, previous gastric surgery, peritonitis ascites, and gastric outlet obstruction. Okay. When it comes to the absolute contraindications for using PEGs in children, this includes the bleeding disorders like we have spoken about in adults, then severe ascites, peritonitis, pharyngeal esophageal obstruction, and during periods of acute severe illness. Uh, for this reason, uh, the patient will not will require to have probably total parental nutrition because they may not be able to benefit from PEG for feeding options. 
So there are precautions when it comes to PEG tubes and the first precaution is about infection and especially where there is active systemic infection because this increases the risk of early mortality and morbidity post PEG placement. So if there is an elevation in the serum CRP and CRP is a test, a blood test that is usually run, uh, especially for most inpatients they will have a CRP done, especially during these COVID times and it is usually the most accurate prognostic indicator of a poor outcome. So if it is severely, severely elevated, this will indicate some bad things are happening within the body and this tube will not be able to help the patient because they are having other serious issues, especially with the infection. Then other comorbidities such as uh, that lead to poor outcomes with increased peg uh, site and systemic infection have been recorded in patients with diabetic mellitus chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases as well as low albumin levels. Therefore, for a PEG to be inserted, the patient has to have uh, some of these conditions controlled first or managed properly before they can actually get a PEG tube inserted. Another precaution comes with the ventricular peritoneal shunts and placement of PEG tube increases the risk of the shunt infection, but this risk increases with increased time between the shunt insertion and the PEG insertion. Prophylactic antibiotics may further reduce the risk of infection. So therefore, even a patient with ventricular peritoneal shunt may have a PEG tube inserted. However, the, if the duration is too long between the two insertions, you may want to consider another route of feeding. Then finally, anatomical, anatomical considerations. In patients with severe kyphoscoliosis, the stomach is often intrathoracic. This particularly applies to patients with cerebral palsy, and radiological and endoscopic, and endoscopic approaches may be impossible. A combined laparoscopic and endoscopic approach may be tried, but this requires general anesthesia, which is also presents a considerable risk for such a patient. And therefore, they may want to consider another route of feeding. The benefits of having a PEG tube inserted or a percutaneous endoscopic gastrotomy tube or jejunostomy tube were it is well tolerated, better than nasogastric tube. Trust you me, if you have seen a patient with a nasogastric tube, especially once they are fully awake, most of the time they will first remove the, the nasogastric tube because of how irritating it gets. It may not be painful, but it irritates. And it's not even sightly to see that tube coming out of yourself. So most of the time when the patients wake up, the first thing they will want to do is pull it out. Even if they are not oriented, for as long as they are rat and they can be able to do something with their hands, then they are going to remove that nasogastric tube. So a peg, the peg tube are better. Uh, they are more comfortable and the patients seem to be unbothered. Most patients seem comfortable with this tube. Then when nutrition status have improved, then we do not require to have a tube. The patient can feed orally and they will be able to retain and they will be able to get the nutrition. Then ease of usage of other methods. Uh, it is quite easy. And uh, most caregivers have preferred PEG over nasogastric or oral feeds, especially for patients who require assisted feeding. Then it is satisfactory use by home caregivers. It is quite easy to use and the patient can be able to feed themselves, the caregivers can be able to feed them, and the nurses can feed them for them while in the hospital setup. Then we have low incidence of complications because again, it is just a tube going through the fat tissue, uh, through the skin to the fat tissue, then to the stomach, which is very, a very short distance of that tube. And this reduces, there's also a reduction in aspiration pneumonia associated with swallowing disorders, especially for a patient who is quite sick and they have to feed orally. They will always run that risk of having an aspiration. Then it is cost effective relative to alternative methods such as TPNs, as I have said, because total parenteral nutrition is quite expensive. And for those people who know about feeds such as Cardivan, Minosteril, um, they don't come in cheap. And remember, it is nutrition for 24 hours until the patient is able to feed orally, and that could get very expensive. And therefore, it is more reasonable and more cost friendly. So there could be complications, and there are different types of complications. There are those that occur immediately, and these include endoscopy-related complications such as hemorrhage or perforation, aspiration, and over-sedation, because you require sedation for you to have the endoscopy done, and this could actually be detrimental if it was done probably the higher dose or your body is not able to tolerate the sedative properly. 
then this complication could also be procedure related such as ileus ileus is when after surgery or after any manipulation on the abdominal area your bowel cells are not yet returned and you are not able to pass gas and you'll find that most people postoperatively or after any procedure that have been done in the abdomen they will be told not to eat until they are able to pass gas and there is always the, the nurse, the doctor coming to listen whether the bowel sounds are there. And once the bowel sounds return, it means now you're out of the ileus and you're able to feed again. In the event that ileus happens, sometimes it could get so bad that you have to go back to theater. But most of the time, it, re, it resolves after a few days. Then we have pneumoperitoneum and uh, that could happen as well. Then there's wound infection wound bleeding infection is when you get a lot of um, bacteria around the area causing pus swelling inflammation and such things wound bleeding is you just see the blood and then injury to the liver bowel or spleen especially if the person inserting it and if they were not doing it uh, uh, as image guided then they may go beyond where the area they were supposed to insert the tube and this could be very 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 dangerous Delayed complications of PEG include gastric outlet obstruction, bar buried bumper syndrome, and this is a migration of the internal bumper of the PEG tube into the gastric or abdominal wall. This is quite dangerous. And then dislodged PEG tube that could happen, peritonitis, peristomal leakage or infection that also happens, uh, skin or gastric ulceration, blocked PEG tube, and this may require to be removed and reinserted again. Tube degradation, where it is the integrity has been questionable and probably they are seeping into other areas requiring change of the tube. Then gastric fistula after removal of the peg tube, it may happen as well. Granulation around the site of insertion of the peg tube, and this may be prevented by the rotation we had talked about earlier. So when it comes to the prognosis, there have been few long-term follow-up studies and clearly the overall mortality rate after peg insertion is higher because of the underlying medical problems. So a five-year prospective study showed that few complications from the procedure itself and improved nutritional status. So these here are the references that are used and they are different ones from online textbooks as well as physical books and I have referenced them there. So if you're interested to learn this more, uh, hit me down in the comment section and I'll be able to answer any and I'll be able to do any video that any person requests at whatever time. So until next time, bye and ciao and remember to be intentional in your health seeking behavior because it is only you who can get yourself the best and the best in this country so until we see each other again know that i love you and i care about every other person